Having a good reaction time is celebrated as a defining feature of top players, but the idea of reaction time and its place in competitive play is often discussed, but seldom examined. Reaction time is complicated, but we use very general and nondescript language for what are really distinct things and concepts, and that leads to a lot of confusion that affects players of all skill levels in different ways from bottom to top. The short answer to the title of this video is, yes, you can. The long answer is the next 15 minutes of this video. When we talk about reaction time, most of us are referring to the kind of reaction time we measure with simple click when we say click software, or for a classic example, the ruler drop test. And to literally no one's surprise, this kind of reaction time is called simple reaction time, or just SRT for short. SRT is concerned with tasks that have only one possible response. This is the kind of reaction time people will just sit at humanbenchmark.com and pop blood vessels trying to spirit bomb their way into improving, and when they don't succeed, they accept defeat and become competitive hot dog eaters instead. But there's another kind. Choice reaction time, or CRT, which is the time it takes you to choose among multiple choices and it's considerably different from SRT. Though there are some aspects of the game that could be described as simple tasks with simple responses, just on this information alone, it seems pretty reasonable to say that CRT describes the kinds of reactions we talk about when we generically refer to our reaction times. And the importance of the distinction between SRT and CRT is really hard to overstate. The danger of confusing SRT with what is really CRT is that SRT is notoriously difficult to improve. It's impossible. You can beat your head against the proverbial wall until your IQ sinks into the single digits, but your SRT will not budge. It's your baseline for sensory information processing, and as such, is frequently cited as a ceiling of one's natural abilities or at least an intractable obstacle there too, and in equal measure cited as something God-given to the chosen ones. CRT, on the other hand, is a lot more interesting. CRT, in contrast to SRT, can be improved, dramatically as it turns out, but in not so obvious ways. So how then? First of which, there's a principle in psychology called Hick's Law, and it states that CRT can either improve or degrade logarithmically, depending on the number of possible choices in a potential decision. For perspective on what a logarithmic scale is, consider that if you're in winner's side of bracket, your placement improves logarithmically each time you win a match. You go from 500th to 125th after just two wins. Yet another principle, called the speed accuracy trade-off, states that the more choices you're hot on the draw for, the more you have to choose between slow or sloppy. Simply put, if you try to react to a lot of different possible things, you're either going to screw up a bunch or take extra time to make sure you're making the right decision. Prediction can shape CRTs as well. Though this seems intuitive enough, let's, let's just throw some studies out there so everybody's happy. A study done in 1989 positively correlated prediction with improved CRT, as well as a second one from 1992 that compared cued and uncued SRTs and CRTs of patients with Parkinson's to a control group and found that cued CRT was significantly higher than uncued in both groups. So how does this information relate to our reaction times? It means that good reactions are governed less by giftedness and savage instinct and more by how effectively we can predict, anticipate, and eliminate potential considerations that might clutter our decision-making process. Two more studies, one which compared the SRTs and CRTs of non-athletes, team sport athletes, and individual sport athletes, and the other which just compared only non-athletes to athletes, failed to positively correlate SRT with CRT. In other words, better SRT, the hardwired kind, did not guarantee better CRT. In short, a lot of these factors are things we have direct control over, whether we're conscious of it or not, which puts the idea that we're trapped under a ceiling of our own inferiority pretty well to bed. By now, it's clear that the things we broadly classify as reactions have nuance and depth that our overly general language doesn't fully reveal. To understand how CRT improvement variables, that is, clarity, option reduction, and prediction, relate to our reactions, we need to split them into three distinct groups, and we'll go ahead and leave SRT out of any further discussion since I'm pretty confident 
most of us would agree that situations with only one possible choice are rare, trivial, or both. These groups are predictions such that foresight trivializes reaction speed and in turn the question is one of timing rather than reaction. Prepared reactions such that you have at least some kind of response queued up and unprepared reactions such that you were taken completely off guard. Let's take a look at some examples of each. For this first one, pay attention to how quickly Gungnir responds to Renai's forward air. It covers so much space and it just packs quite a punch or a kick. Here we go. That was one tasty reaction. I'd like to eat that reaction's liver with some fava beans and a nice bottle of key ante. But I'm, <laughs> I'm sure some of you thought I was going to say something different. But was it really a great reaction? Let's think about how long it took Renai to go from a neutral ledge animation to connecting his fort air on Gungnir's shield. Ledge release is frame one. So is double jump. And we'll give him a jump ascent time of three frames. Fort air startup is ten frames, and we'll tack two frames onto that for travel time. So far, that's 17 frames. One frame is 16.7 milliseconds. 16.7 times 17 gets us 283.9 milliseconds. Initially, that seems reasonable, but consider that even the best monitors suffer three frames of latency, as well as the time needed to actually hit your buttons. We'll be generous and put that at five frames. Subtract that from the base 283 milliseconds to get a 150 millisecond CRT. Uh, <laughs> A choice reaction of 150 milliseconds is, actually, you, you know what, I'm actually, I'm, I'm delighted that, <laughs> I'm delighted that the mythical is now becoming reality, because if a 150 millisecond choice reaction time is possible, then I have renewed faith in my search for Dingo Neck, the legendary jungle walrus, and its sister, the manatee of Helena. Even for SRT, that number is fantasy, let alone for CRT. What we saw there wasn't a knee-jerk reaction that spawned at the moment of stimulus, but rather a prediction. There's just no other explanation. So with that, we've established that prediction can explain absurdly low CRT, and I argue that predictive actions constitute the majority of the game at a high level. This next one's a prepared reaction, and notice how Leo's option coverage with down tilt to grab early in the set and his reactions to ledge getups as the set progresses. Hard time landing against his character, a hard time making them. And look at these percentages and you know exactly what he's looking for. Unfortunately, with Bayonetta Footstool, you know a which time character she is. With Bayonetta's grab and all pertinent numbers crunched, Leo had about 332 milliseconds to punish Tweak's ledge getup. Though CRTs vary with respect to a, a whole bunch of things, like type of stimulus, number of choices, and the list basically goes on for eternity, they range from 250 milliseconds for simple tasks up to 450 milliseconds, and while variables that produce these exact data may not be perfectly comparable to those in Smash, I feel these numbers give us a reasonable frame of reference for comparison, and if we can agree to that, then 332 milliseconds seems pretty attainable when you consider that that time can fluctuate if you focus on one or two options, which I argue even top players do, and I think is evident in the evolution of Leo's option selections, which make the reality of improved and achievable reactability as described by Hicks Law and the accuracy speed trade-off come to life, because Leo only started to react to Tweak's ledge get-ups after doing a guess and check with his initial option coverage, and once he'd narrowed down Tweak's one or two preferred ledge options, he deliberately looked for them, and as a result, I claim, improved his reaction time, needing only to select from two potential responses instead of three or four. And prepared reactions, I would say, constitute a minority of overall actions in high-level play, and I say that because I'm confident that you will also laugh if you try to imagine everything a person does taking, like, a fourth to a whole half of a second. But... Prepared reactions are still worth talking about, and ledge situations, like in the Leo Tweet clips, represent the truly reactive side of the game nicely. This last one's an unprepared reaction. You know whose voice that really it's is, It's Sakurai. Right? It's yes, the it voice is. of God! The creator! is a Gordo of God! Wow! Getting I'm not going to insult anyone's intelligence by citing studies for the effects of being unprepared when you react to something. 
If you're still skeptical, though, that your unprepared reaction time suffers almost irredeemably from prepared reaction time, no matter how gifted you are, a game of blindfolded baseball may change your mind. Unprepared reaction times are usually so bad that even a good unprepared reaction time, relatively speaking, would be as useful as a teapot made of chocolate, which I think underscores an important point about how truly much precognition and forethought affect our reactions. Analyzing these three distinct classes of responses has likely taught us three things. First of which, that many things we'd call reactions are way too fast to be a genuine reaction, but rather are predictions. Secondly, most reactable situations require CRTs that are within a reasonable range, especially considering the high level of control we have over variables that influence our CRTs. And thirdly and lastly, unprepared reactions suffer so badly that it's likely that even relatively good unprepared reactions are still too far gone to be useful. So, I think we're now in a pretty good position to explain both good and bad reaction times, and how what you're doing could be affecting your reactions negatively, and how to potentially influence them positively. One explanation for slow reactions could be weak prediction, and it's worth emphasizing that prediction doesn't have to come in the form of big, meaty Ford Smash reads. In my last video, I actually talked a lot about how important clear, organized understanding of options is to consistently succeed in a matchup, and that has a lot of overlap with clarity of thought, which directly concerns prediction and reaction. If organization and clarity don't seem as important here as I'm letting on, consider if I asked you to find a card in a shuffled deck versus a deck that's been sorted by number. If you take the shuffled deck, you have to search one by one. If you take the ordered deck, you can check the middle, and if the number you're looking for is lower than what's in the middle, you don't have to bother searching the upper half of the deck, you can just repeat the strategy until you find the right card and vice versa. In a deck of 100 cards, the 1x1 one one strategy could, at worst, take 100 individual card checks to find the right card. The sorted strategy would take, at worst, 7. This strategy is known in computer science as binary searching and is also how some decision strategies are modeled in psychology. And though I'd be remiss to say this is how most of us perceive our decision-making process, the parallel is simply to recognize how important it is to efficiently narrow down possibilities. Another explanation could be that you try to raw react to too many things. If you try to react to the totality of Sheik's bajillion ledge options, you've got a bajillion things to be ready for. No one could do that, and it's a mistake to think otherwise. For instance, if you think about it, no one reacts to all ledge options all the time, and this is why option coverage is so important at the ledge. Each new potential choice spreads you thinner, so even if one particular option is comically slow, like Palutena's ledge getup, that option becomes less and less reactable with each additional option you gear up for. Reaction is appropriate when you're absolutely confident in one or two possible options, and sometimes even that's pushing it. And if you try to react without a pretty narrow idea of what's coming, you'll miss what are allegedly easy reactions and think that your reaction time sucks. I'm not trying to pick on poor old Gungnir here, but trying to react when it isn't appropriate is most definitely a thing at all levels of play. Watch how late Gungnir's F tilt is after Renai's ledge jump. Here we go. Patient play again. Gungnir looking for an opportunity to punish. Renai on stage. I, I guess that Gungnir was trying to react to Renai's ledge jump, but didn't realize that doing so just isn't realistic without some predictive factor. Ledge jumps are 13 frames, and that's well beyond reasonable reaction time, even for SRTs. Finally, the main thing I'd like you to take away from this video is that reaction time isn't a static number that unilaterally determines your potential as a player. With the high variability of CRT and how responsive CRT is to changes in thinking, it's really unlikely that any person's reaction time is bottom line better than another's, at least in a way that would make them categorically superior. Reaction times don't prescribe ceilings and caps, rather they describe and are the result of underlying habits, methods, and thought processes that may not be entirely obvious and are, I would argue, mostly developed rather than given. For some, this develops more intuitively and naturally. Others have to grab the chisel and start sculpting. But in either case, I interpret all of this in the following way. The player makes the reaction. The reaction does not make the player. 
Anyway, I'm starting to get sick of hearing myself talk, and I'm sure you are too. So with that, I'll say thank you to everyone for taking the time to see another journey through to the end with me, and more stuff will be on the way soon, so I as always encourage you to subscribe and share. Those two things, though it might not seem like it, really do go a long way, and I appreciate it very much. At that, thank you. See you.